The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled The Role of the Eosinophil in COPD, Implications for Precision Care and Novel Treatments, featuring Dr. Reynold Panettieri, Jr. from Rutgers University. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash UZZ. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Recently, attention has focused on the persistent blood and airway eosinophilia that is found in up to 40% of patients with this devastating disease. These patients have a higher risk of adverse outcomes than patients without eosinophilia. Although, there is still much to be learned. This knowledge may help guide treatment selections for these patients, both in terms of predicting response to corticosteroids, as well as for the future, as novel agents targeting eosinophilic inflammation are currently under study in COPD. Eosinophils are derived from pluripotent CD34 positive progenitor stem cells found in the normal bone marrow. This differentiation occurs under the influence of GM, CSF, and IL-3 in early phases and IL-5 in the latter phases of differentiation. Mature eosinophils are released from bone marrow into the circulation and this is primarily regulated by IL-5. Eosinophils are transformed from a quiescent state to a state of increased hyperresponsiveness by priming agents such as these cytokines IL-3, IL-5, and GM-CSF. Eosinophils can be recruited to the lungs under certain circumstances or conditions. These may be found in the airways, tissues, and circulation of patients with COPD, both during stable disease and exacerbations. These immune cells are associated with the risk of COPD exacerbations, mortality, and decline in FEV1. They are also associated with response to both inhaled and systemic corticosteroids. Eosinophilic inflammation can be measured in the airway by sputum analysis and bronchoscopic sampling. Blood eosinophil counts have been used as a surrogate for eosinophilic airway inflammation and to determine the intensity of eosinophilic inflammation in the blood compartment. Studies have shown a moderate correlation between blood eosinophil count and sputum eosinophil count. Additionally, sputum IL-5 levels have been shown to be significantly higher in patients classified as having high eosinophil counts versus low eosinophil counts. Other biomarkers associated with eosinophilic airway inflammation include fractional exhaled nitric oxide or Th2 activation markers such as serum periostin, which is still investigational. In one study, of 167 patients who experienced a severe COPD exacerbation, 55 had eosinophilia, defined as at least 200 cells per microliter and or at least 2% of the white blood cell count, which was associated with increased risk of 12-month COPD-related readmission, increased risk of all-cause readmission and shorter time to first COPD related readmission. Therefore, blood eosinophil levels can be used as a biomarker in severe COPD exacerbations for predicting higher readmission rates. However, a large well-characterized cohort of former and current smokers with a broad range of COPD severity, the spiromics cohort, showed that high concentrations of sputum eosinophils were a better biomarker than high 
concentrations of bloody eosinophils to identify a patient subgroup with more severe disease, more frequent exacerbations, and increased emphysema by quantitative CT. In another study, patients with significant emphysema on high resolution CT had lower levels of bloody eosinophils. No differences were observed for sputum eosinophils. Studies have also examined the role of eosinophils in predicting response to treatment. For example, the Korean obstructive lung disease study showed that high bloody eosinophils defined as more than 260 cells per microliter and high plasma periostin defined as more than 23 nanograms per milliliter were associated with improved lung function after three months of ICS lava treatment. In particular, high bloody eosinophils in combination with age and baseline lung function parameters may be a possible biomarker for the identification of COPD patients with favorable FEV1 improvement in response to ICS lava treatment. In a review of studies of the fluticasone salmeterol combination in patients with COPD, moderate and severe exacerbation rates were analyzed according to baseline blood eosinophil levels. For patients with bloody eosinophils of at least 2%, fluticasone salmeterol was associated with significant reductions in exacerbation rates compared with teotropium and placebo. No significant difference was seen in the subgroup of patients with bloody eosinophils of less than 2%. No relationship was observed between eosinophil subgroup and treatment effect on FEV1 and the SGRQ. In control one, a post hoc pooled analysis of three randomized trials of the use of budesonide from Motorol and COPD investigated patient characteristics that may interact with treatment response to a combination of budesonide and from Motorol versus from Motorol alone. In patients treated, with formoterol alone, the risk of exacerbation increased as blood eosinophil levels increased. In patients treated with budesonide formoterol, the risk of exacerbation was consistent across the blood eosinophil continuum. The magnitude of protection against risk of exacerbation in patients treated with budesonide formoterol compared with formoterol alone increased with rising blood eosinophil levels. In current smokers with increased bloody eosinophils at baseline, budesonide for motorol significantly reduced the rate of exacerbation by 68% compared with for motorol alone. In former smokers, the risk was reduced by 34 to 39%. In the 12 month wisdom trial, COPD patients who received teotropium, salmeterol, and fluticasone daily for six weeks were randomly assigned to receive either continued or reduced inhaled steroid over 12 weeks. A post hoc analysis after complete ICS withdrawal after months three and 12 compared the rate of exacerbations and time to exacerbation outcomes on the basis of blood eosinophil subgroups of increasing cutoff levels. Moderate or severe exacerbation rates were higher in the ICS withdrawal group versus the ICS continuation group in patients with the eosinophil counts of 2% or greater, 4% or greater, and 5% or greater. The increase in exacerbation rate became more pronounced as the eosinophil cutoff level rose. Significant treatment by subgroup interaction was reached for 4 and 5% only. Researchers concluded that eosinophil counts of 4% or greater, or at least 300 cells per microliter may identify deleterious effect of ICS withdrawal. Agents directly targeting eosinophils by inhibiting IL-5 are under development for the treatment of COPD. Mepolizumab is one such treatment 
that is currently approved for patients with eosinophilic asthma and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis or EGPA. Metrix and Metrio were two phase three randomized trials comparing mepolizumab with placebo in COPD patients with a history of moderate or severe exacerbations while taking ICS-based triple maintenance therapy. Mepolizumab at a dose of 100 milligrams was associated with a lower annual rate of moderate or severe exacerbations than placebo among patients with COPD and an eosinophilic phenotype. The difference was significant in Metrex, but not Metrio. In Metrex, the time to first moderate or severe exacerbation was significantly longer with mepolizumab than placebo in the modified intention to treat population with an eosinophilic phenotype, but not in the overall modified intention to treat population. A greater effect of mepolizumab was found among patients with higher blood eosinophil counts at screening. The safety profile of mepolizumab was similar to that of placebo. These data have been submitted to the FDA. Benralizumab, a monoclonal antibody that targets IL-5 receptor alpha, is also approved for eosinophilic asthma and is being investigated for the treatment of COPD. A phase two study was conducted in adults with moderate to severe COPD, at least one acute exacerbation, and sputum eosinophil count of at least 3% within the previous year. The primary endpoint was not met because benralizumab did not reduce the rate of acute exacerbations of COPD compared with placebo in protocol population, nor did it attenuate symptoms or health-related quality of life. However, benralizumab did provide clinically significant improvements in lung function, which were sustained up to week 80 that's 32 weeks after the last dose. Non-significant improvements in acute exacerbations of COPD, FEV1, and health-related quality of life were greater in the benralizumab-treated patients with raised concentrations of peripheral blood and sputum eosinophils. The safety profile was similar to that noted in previous studies of subcutaneous benralizumab in patients with asthma. However, Serious adverse events were reported by a slightly higher proportion of patients in the benralizumab group than in the placebo group, although none were considered to be related to treatment. In summary, blood eosinophil levels may guide treatment in terms of identifying COPD patients who may respond to ICS lava treatment. Novel agents such as benralizumab and mepolizumab are promising in a subgroup of patients with COPD who have an eosinophilic phenotype. Further studies are still needed to explore the contribution of eosinophils to the mechanism of disease in COPD and identify their association with levels of clinical risk. Well, that ends our discussion for today. I hope you found it informative and useful. Thank you very much for participating in this educational activity focused on the role of eosinophils in COPD. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash UZZ. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca LP.